Thank you for joining us Around the Fire. For more information or to make a donation, please visit randomactnetwork.com. Now, want to hear a scary story? It was a dull, dark, and soundless day in autumn when I came upon the melancholy house of Usher. I do not know why, but I felt an intolerable gloom. There was nothing poetic or beautiful about this scene, only the dreary house on the edge of a cliff over a black lake surrounded by dead and rotting trees. Still, I was planning to spend some weeks here. Its owner, Roderick Usher, had been one of my closest childhood friends, even though I had not seen him for many years. However, he had sent me a letter. He wrote of an oppressive mental disease and his great desire to see me, his only personal friend. He hoped that my company would make him feel better, so I had to come. Although we had been very close as boys, I knew very little about my friend because he was so reserved. He came from a very ancient family, famous for both its wonderful works of art and its great acts of charity. The entire Usher family lay in the direct line of descent for centuries, passing the mansion from father to son, so that the peasants of the region called both the family itself and the property the House of Usher. The structure itself was incredibly old and greatly discolored by time. Even though individual stones were ruined and crumbling, no portion of the house had fallen. However, If you looked very carefully, you could see a very thin crack. It ran from the roof of the building in front and made its way down the wall in a zigzag direction until it became lost in the dark waters of the lake. A valet led me through the many dark and intricate passages. I felt an increasing gloom as we walked. On one of the staircases, I met the doctor of the family, who looked both cunning and perplexed. He stopped to speak with me a moment and then went on. Finally, the valet opened the door of the studio. It was very large and high. There were many pieces of furniture, comfortless, antique, and tattered. Many books and musical instruments lay about the room, too. An air of deep and hopeless gloom hung over and pervaded all. Roderick Usher got up from a sofa and greeted me warmly. We then sat down, and for some moments while he did not speak, I looked at him with pity and fear. Surely no man had ever changed in so short a period as had Roderick Usher. I could hardly believe that he was the same person who had been my boyhood friend. The ghastly pallor of his skin and the miraculous shine of his eyes shocked and even frightened me. His hair, which he had allowed to grow, floated rather than fell about his face. My friend's actions were incoherent and inconsistent. At times he was full of great energy and at times he was sullen. He suffered from an extreme acuteness of the senses. He could only endure the most insipid food. He could only wear clothing of a certain texture. The odors of all flowers were oppressive. His eyes were tortured by even a faint light and there were only a few special sounds and these from stringed instruments, which did not inspire him with horror. He also told me his strange belief that not only did plants have feelings, but also inorganic things as well. He believed that the home of his ancestors was somehow alive. He was also completely dependent on an unusual kind of terror, and he believed that the gloomy house itself and the dark lake had a great effect on his existence. He admitted, however, that much of his sadness came from the long illness and the approaching death of his beloved sister, his only companion for many years and his last and only relative on earth. Her death, he said, would make me the last of the ancient line of the ushers. While he spoke, his sister, the Lady Madeline, walked slowly through the other end of the studio and, without seeing me, disappeared. None of Madeline's doctors had been able to help her. She suffered from apathy, a gradual wasting away of her person, and frequent seizure attacks. 
I learned that the glimpse I had of her would probably be my last, that the lady, at least while living, would be seen by me no more. For the next few days, we did not mention her name, and during this time, I tried to make my friend feel better. We painted and read together, or I listened as if in a dream to the wild improvisations of his playing the guitar. One of the paintings was particularly striking. It presented an immensely long tunnel with low walls that were smooth, white without decoration. It was far below the earth. It had no window nor any other light. It was full of a ghastly and inappropriate splendor. One evening, Usher told me that Madeline had died. He was going to keep her body in a family vault for two weeks before burying her in the family cemetery. He had decided to do this because of the strange nature of his sister's disease, his distrust of her doctors, and the great distance of the cemetery. The vault was deep underground, directly below my bedroom. The room had lived previous lives as a dungeon and a deposit for gunpowder. When we had placed the coffin in the vault, we lifted up the lid to look at her face. The first thing I noticed was the great similarity between the brother and sister. Usher, guessing my thoughts, told me that they had been twins and that there had always been a strange understanding between them. This woman who had died so young still had a faint color and a strange smile which is so terrible in death. This is not unusual for those who have died of some form of catalepsy, so we put the lid back on the coffin and returned to our rooms above. Several days later, I began to see a great change in my friend. He no longer read, painted, or played music. He wandered around the mansion and his pallor increased. His voice shook when he spoke, as if from extreme terror. At times he stared into space for hours as if he were listening to some imaginary sound. Slowly, I myself began to believe his fantastic superstitions. On the seventh or eighth night after placing Madeline in the vault, I felt the full power of these feelings. It was stormy outside and I could not sleep. I could not stand it anymore and began to walk back and forth in my room. A few minutes later, Usher entered my room holding a lamp. He was pale as usual, but now there was a kind of mad laughter in his eyes. And haven't you seen it? He said suddenly after having stared at me for a few moments in silence. You have not seen it, but wait, you will. Then he hurried to one of the windows and opened it to the storm outside. It was a windy night of singular terror and beauty, and the gale entered the room and nearly lifted us from our feet. A kind of whirlwind blew around the house and a heavy vapor was around us, glowing unnaturally and blocking the light from the stars. You must not, you will not look at this, I said to Usher, and I led him with gentle violence from the window to a seat. I explained to him that the strange light outside was just an electrical phenomenon, or perhaps it came from the rotting plants in the lake. So I picked up a book, Mad Trist by Sir Lancelot Canning, and began to read it to Usher. I hoped that this would bring him some relief. I then came to that well-known part of the story where Ethelred, the hero of the story, tries to break into the home of the evil hermit. Here the story goes like this. And now the courageous Ethelred began to break down the door with his stick. As he hit the door, the wood cracked apart and the sound could be heard throughout the forest. At the end of the sentence, I started because I thought that I heard from some remote part of the mansion a sound just like the sound described in the book. But Ethelred did not see the evil hermit. Instead, he saw a giant dragon with a fiery tongue that was guarding a palace of gold with a silver floor. On the wall, a shield hung on which was written, whoever enters here, a conqueror has been. Whoever kills the dragon, the shield will win. And Ethelred lifted his stick and struck the head of the dragon, which died with such a horrible shriek that Ethelred had to cover his ears. Indeed, such a dreadful noise had never been heard before. I was now certain that I heard somewhere in the mansion the exact same shriek described by the novelist. However, I remained calm because I did not want to frighten my friend. I was not at all certain that he had heard those sounds. 
He had, though, moved his chair so that he faced the door of the room, and now his body rocked slowly side to side. I continued the story. And now Ethelred, having killed the dragon, went to get the shield on the wall, but before he even put his hand on the shield, it fell with a terrible ringing sound. The same ringing and metallic sound in the house completely unnerved. I jumped to my feet, but Usher continued rocking gently in his chair. I rushed to the chair, and he stared in front of him. I put my hands on his shoulder, and his whole body shook. There was a horrible smile on his face. He spoke quickly and indistinctly. I bent over him and finally understood what he was saying. Don't you hear it? Long, 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 many minutes, many hours, many days I have heard it, and yet I didn't dare to speak. We have put her living in the tomb. Didn't I tell you that my senses were acute? I now tell you that I heard her moving in the coffin. I heard it many, many days ago, yet I dared not. I dared not speak, and now tonight, Ethelred, ha! Ha! The breaking of the hermit's door, and the death cry of the dragon, and the ringing sound of the shield? No, we didn't hear those things. We heard the opening of the coffin, the sound of the doors of her prison, and her fighting to escape from the vault. Where can I escape to? Won't she be here soon? Isn't she hurrying here to scream at me for having buried her too soon? Have I not heard her coming up the stairs? Can't I hear the horrible beating of her heart? Madman? At this point, he jumped up and shrieked, Madman, I tell you that she now stands outside the door. As if the superhuman energy of this world was magical, the door opened. It was the wind that did this, but then outside the door there did stand Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood on her white clothing and signs of the terrible struggle to escape from the coffin. For a moment she stood trembling, and then in her violent and now final death agonies fell heavily on her brother, pulling him to the floor. In that moment he too died, a victim of the terrors he had anticipated. I ran from the room. The storm was blowing with all its force and I crossed the old causeway. Suddenly there was a flash of wild light. The light was of the full and blood-red moon, which now shone vividly through that zigzag crack in the house. While I watched, this crack widened rapidly, and the wind blew fiercely, and the entire moon suddenly appeared. The mighty walls fell apart, and the deep lake closed sullenly and silently over the fragments of the House of Usher.